God and the Lamb. What a great day. Glad to see you here to worship with us today. God is good. We've been in a series of messages dealing with prophecy, and we've been entitled Back to the Future. Uh, today we're going to be looking at part five in this series. Uh, if you've been following along with this series, you know that we've talked about a lot of stuff. We've focused in on three or four of those messages just on Matthew 24. And in Matthew 24, it talked about the signs of the time when Jesus gave the disciples an answer to the questions they were asking. When shall these things be? When will the temple be torn down? What's going to be the signs of the end of the age? They asked about three questions. And Jesus started giving them the answers. We spent several of those sermons breaking down elements of Matthew 24 and many other passages within the Old and New Testament about when these things would be. He talked about the fig tree that was cursed, remember, before that day. And then, then he, that he said, watch the, the budding of the fig tree. And the fig tree represents, according to the Old Testament, the nation of Israel. We talked about, in our last message, the, the rebirth. Never before in history has a nation done that. A, a nation that's been dispersed and, and destroyed had been restored. In 1948, we talked about how Israel became a nation again. And that started back in, in even in the late 1800s with the Zionist movement trying to prepare a place in Palestine. We talked a lot about Israel, Israel's part in prophecy, and how that about, if you look at prophecy, Israel's involved in pretty much about 100% of all prophecy. So I want to deal just a little bit more today with Israel. Remember a few weeks ago, we talked about the wars of the end times when we dealt with that statement that Jesus said, There'll be wars and rumors of wars. We talked about these six or seven wars that are mentioned here on, on the overhead with you. The war of extermination. Psalms 83 gives a prophetic psalm. Now, some believe it's more just a prayer than it is a prophecy. There are others, conservative theologians, that view it the other way. Some conservative theologians consider it a, not so much a prophecy as a supplication for when Israel is surrounded by our enemies. But either way, we, we called it a war of extermination where there was, it will be an attempt to exterminate Israel. Followed by the first war of Gog and Magog, Ezekiel 38 and 39. Third war we mentioned was a conventional war of the tribulation where Antichrist is getting his foothold because there's a resistance to his, his, his Christhood, his Antichristhood. And how that will lead to a larger nuclear war in the whole of the Middle East and in the world. And then how there will be a war in, heavens in, in, in the heavens in Revelation 12, which is a war that doesn't take place on the planet. It's above the planet when demons try to uh, come against Michael and the archangels. And they lose that war, obviously. And then Revelation 12 talks about a war against the Jews and the saints. Antichrist will ultimately attempt to eradicate the planet of all believers. Anybody who believes in the God of Jacob. All right, so he tries to annihilate them. And then the last Middle East campaign of the Antichrist in Daniel chapter 11, ending obviously with the Lord of glory returning and destroying the enemy completely. Amen. But these are the wars. What I want to look at though is a little more closely is that war, that first war, the second in the list, the war of Gog and Magog. Since we're talking so much about Israel last week, let me just focus in on some things that we, we need to look at in regard to the importance of Israel and how the Lord will... Now, the Lord will spare the nation of Israel in these last days and has miraculously provided them a, a place on the world stage. Like we said, no other nation, no other uh, tribe in all of the nations of history has ever been repatriated into a land along with their original national tongue, Hebrew, which had been a lost language. So as we look at this battle in Ezekiel 38 and 9, the primary purpose of me sharing this today is to examine where we're at, what's going on in the world today, what are the current events? What are the current signs of the times that would point to the fact that we're about to see this kind of war take place? Now, if we're going to do that, we need to look at Ezekiel's chapters 38 and chapter 39 to, to achieve our purpose. So we're going to, have to look at that passage. Last week, in talking about Israel and prophecy and the budding of the fig tree, and it really deals with Ezekiel 37 where we see the restoration of the nation of Israel. Remember those chapters in Ezekiel where Ezekiel's talking to the, to the Lord and the Lord says, he takes him to this valley of dry bones and he has this vision there of the valley of dry bones and the Lord says to the prophet, will these bones live again? He says, well, Lord, you know. And how you know that the bones became reconstituted together and then they begin to take on flesh and then God breathed into them. This is a symbol of the restoration of the nation of Israel, the prophet points out to us. That one day this, this nation that's been so widely dispersed across all the nations of the world will once again come back into the land. As you look at this passage in Ezekiel, these, these chapters 36, 37, 38, 39, even chapter 40, they're all in a chronological order. They all fit together. And Ezekiel 38 and 39 is what we're going to be focusing on, uh, where we have focused on last week 
We saw the restoration of Israel, the rebuilding of the nation. They come back together. They're, they, are, they are back in the land together. And uh, we want to see as, as they're in, back in the land, all the prophets de de declared in those end times that Israel would be there, but it would be under great harassment and objection and rejection by the world. And we have certainly seen that in the day and the time that we live in. But I think it's really important at the outset to put these things in a, a very larger uh, uh, literal and historical setting. So we're going to look at what is taking place there. And we're going to look at a basic overview. And we'll, we'll, we'll pr pretty much look at the, uh, this battle of Gog and we uh, Magog. And we'll see that this is the climax of all that irritation and all that harassment from the nations that reject Israel and, and want to destroy the nation of Israel. So as we look at this and we see what this is, we'll see that, there's, that God is doing a, a, a work in the world today whereby these nations that will come against a nation that wouldn't even exist until that generation will come against that nation and what those nations are and who they are and kind of look at and see what happens with the battle of Gog and Magog. In 38 and 39, focus on this judgment, this second coming, the eschatological, this second coming judgment of, uh, that happens uh, of Israel for its enemies. And it's not Israel necessarily bringing the judgment against these invading forces. We'll see in this passage also how God literally intervenes to do his work here. The, pro the, the prophecy of Ezekiel 38 and 9 can be divided into two main purposes. It talks about the defeat of Gog in chapter 38 and then how God, dis how God disposes of Gog in chapter 39. And we'll see that this is a judgment. Just as much of the very end times comes to a climax, we do see a judgment on all the nations and we see God working in the midst of Israel so that they return as a covenant people to the old covenant of Abraham that God had made with them. So let's first of all, if said, we're going to look at the who, the what, the where, the when, the why's, take a little, kind of a journalistic approach to all this and see what this whole battle is all about. And I, I really want you to realize today that we're talking in the context of what was prophesied over 2,000 years ago. And 2,000 years ago, certain things, you know, over this period of time have had to happen. Certain nations have to rise. Certain nations have to fall. Certain nations have to come back to a place of existence like Israel. I mean, all this stuff has to happen. And now, really, for the first time in history, are we seeing all this? And I'll point out as we go through this why I believe that this is relevant today and why it's important today to take a very close look at and discover that we really are in, is what the Apostle Paul said, the end times. And I believe with all my heart, we're in the end of the end times. We talk about the last days, and these certainly must be the last hours of the last days as we study prophecy together. Who is involved? Who are the nations listed in this Ezekiel prophecy? You know, the, their, their name, uh, these names are all identify with the grandchildren of Noah that are mentioned in Genesis chapter 10 as they're sent out and dispersed to replenish the earth and re rebuild the, uh, after the destruction of the flood to go back in these parts of the world. So all these are listed there as, as in, in, this, in, in the scripture. But I want to focus on these verses where it lists the participants, all right, who are going to be involved in this great end time war. In Ezekiel 38, it says, And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog and the land of Magog and the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him and say, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I'm against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, and I will turn you about and put hooks in your jaws, and I will bring you out, and all of your army, your horses, your horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all of them wielding swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and put with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer, with all its troops, and Beth Togomar from the remote part of the north with all its troops, many people with you. Be prepared and prepare yourself, you and all your companies that are assembled about you, and be a guard for them. Now he starts mentioning a person, first of all, Gog, this prince of Rosh, and then he lists this, this, this list of nine other proper names in scripture that we see. Now I believe if you look at this, and most theologians agree with this, that when it talks about Gog, it's not talking about a country there. It's talking about a person. Now, we don't know who that person will be. I believe it's a symbolic name that was taken from, you know, the, a, a, a leader by a name that's similar to that during the time, you know, of Ezekiel and before the time of Ezekiel. In fact, because of that, 
There are a lot of people say, oh, this battle took place already because Gog, you know, he was a guy in history and Ezekiel was prophesying about him, you know, and so, it, it, so that necess- that's not talking about a prophetic thing, but let me tell you about this particular person they're talking about. A lot of modern scholars say this Gog was identified with Gyges or Gugu was another terminology used. He was a 7th century B.C. Lydian king. He's mentioned in six inscriptions found on the walls of Assyrian monarchs, all right? Uh, But he was an ancient ruler. He he reigned a century before Ezekiel. So he can't be the fulfillment of the prophecy because he lived before that. And he never led an invasion into Israel. But I do believe that Ezekiel uses this particular name, like we see in Scripture at times, as as an archetype or symbol of this great end time prophetic war that would take place and would be led by an individual. There are names that are associated with this, with this name. There's names of nine countries. And let me, let me just list those nine countries out for you. And then we'll talk about them individually. There's Rosh and Magog and Meshach and Tubal and Persia, Ethiopia, Libya, Gomer and Beth Togomar. Those are all the names that are listed here in Ezekiel 38. Now who, who would that represent in the modern world today? And are those countries, do they have any alliances? Are there any uh, relationships? Could there ever be this kind of cohesive agreement to invade a land together? Well, let's go down the list, and I'll even explain a little bit further. For the modern nations, the Rosh, most, many theologians believe, comes from Rashu, Rasupu, Ras, or Rus, is, is Russia. Magog, on the other hand, is, a, is Scythian. It occupies what we'd call Central Asia and those countries immediately surrounding Afghanistan. That would be uh, Magog. Meshach would be Mushki and Mushka. Some people believe that this is uh, a, a part and a major part of the land we call Turkey today. Tubal is the other section of that particular country. So we see Turkey here. And then it mentions Persia. Most of you are aware that Persia today is modern day Iran. And it also mentions Ethiopia there, which would be the Sudan, according to modern terminology. And then there's Libya, or called Put here, uh, which is mentioned. And I'm going to give you a little more clarification on each one of these countries in just a moment, by the way. And there's a country called Gomer, occupied the Sumerians. That would be Turkey or Eastern Europe or even like East Germany, some of those former Soviet countries that were aligned with the USSR in those days. And Beth Targomar also represents Turkey as far as up to the Ukraine. And we know Russia's influence in the Ukraine today. But there's, you know, as you look at the first one, he says, Rosh, you know, most people do agree that this points the finger to Russia. As far back even as uh, uh, Wilhelm Jacinius, who was uh, what most modern scholars describe as uh, one of the greatest scholars of the Hebrew language, Jacinius, he wrote about this particular passage and he said unquestionably in Ezekiel, he's talking about a name of a country that we could properly identify with Russia. He says that Rosh in Ezekiel 38 is, is a proper noun of a, of a northern nation mentioned with Meshach and Tubal Undoubtedly the Russians is what he said. They're mentioned by the Byzantine writers of the 10th century under the name of Ross. They're dwelling to the north of Taurus as dwelling on the river Ra, which would be the Volga River today. Second, there's another historical evidence that places this known as Rosh was familiar in the ancient world. There's a, the world view as a variety of forms of spelling of this particular country, but the idea whether it's Rosh or Russia or Rash, it's all identified as, exist- as existing as early and people dwelling in this country and living in this country and trading out of this country as early as 2,600 years before Jesus was born. It's even mentioned 2,600 years before Jesus was born in ancient Egyptian writings as Rosh. Then there's Magog that it mentions there. According to Josephus, if you're familiar with Josephus, he was a historian during the, the Roman times and the Roman Empire. He said the ancient Scythians inhabited this lands and the Scythians were the northern nomadic tribes who inhabited territory from Central Asia across the southern steppes of the Russian borders, the modern Russia. Magog today probably represents that former underbelly of the USSR, those what I call the Yukistan countries. Y'all know what those are, right? You got Tajikistan and, and, and Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan and Turkmenistan and all the other stands that live down there. They represent that, that particular area that we would call biblically Magog. All those nations are dominated, by the way, by about 60 to 70 million 
Muslims. You have the Russians, you have the Muslims. You go on down to Meshach and Tubal. They are mentioned also in the word of God here. Meshach and Tubal are mentioned in Ezekiel. In fact, they're mentioned twice. A lot of people believe that was the modern towns of Moscow and Tubalsk. Others say not necessarily so. Those cities related more to the cities that did trade in the Middle East and associated more with northern Turkey. And so it looks like in modern times that that would be what we call today Turkey. And then Persia said we don't need a lot of identification there. The ancient land of Persia has become the modern nation of Iran back in March of 1935. And then in 1979, they renamed themselves the Islamic Republic of Iran. It represents a population of about 68 million. So I've only mentioned two of those nations' population. They're already at close to 200 million people. Remember last week we mentioned Israel's population about 8.5, 8.8. Then there's Ethiopia or Cush. The Hebrew word Cush is found in Ezekiel 38.5 and it's often translated in modern versions as Ethiopia. But ancient Cush was a, was a land and, and people of the southern Nile Valley that was all that upper Egyptian area, extended from Syene to the south. It was called Kasu by the Assyrians and by the Babylonians. The Egyptians called this area the Kais or the Kos. Uh, the Greeks had a name for it as well, Cush. It's directly south of Egypt. It extends down past the modern city of Khartoum into the capital of what we call modern day Sudan. So this makes up what we would call on the African peninsula there, on the African northern part there, the modern country of Sudan, known in ancient lands as Kush. But also Sudan, another hardline Islamic nation, supported Iraq in the Gulf War, by the way, and in the late mid to late 90s, they harbored Osama bin Laden. He, he hid, hid there. So we're talking about another Islamic nation. And then there's the country that's mentioned in scripture as Put. That was a North African nation. From the Babylonian Chronicle appears that Put was a distant land to the west of Egypt and would be modern day Libya. The Septuagint renders the word Put is Lubus, Libyus. The, the brown drives bigger Briggs lexicon, which is where most theologians refer to anymore, identifies Put with modern day Libya, all right? So we have modern day Libya in this mix, which is also an Islamic nation. By the way, let me just kind of give you a map of whether you see put off to the right there and Persia off the left, you see Kush and you see Libya, all this the east, west and south. And then, then you see north, you see, you see Gomer and Magog. Gomer has often been identified with Eastern Germany uh, before the fall of communism, but it also takes up, it took up part of that land towards the Baltics and the Eastern European nations on towards the Black Sea and the Caspian Sea. So that's another part that the Cambridge ancient history states that the Syrian Gemari is the Hebrew word for Gomer. It began at the eighth century BC as the Sumerians who occupied this territory, which again takes up Turkey all the way into Eastern Europe. Joseph noted that the Gomerites were identified with the Galatians who inhabited what is central Turkey today. And then there's the country of Togomar or Beth Togomar. Beth is a word in Hebrew, which means house. So this was the house of, of Togomar. It's mentioned in Ezekiel 27 also as a nation that traded in Israel in the Middle East uh, with inhabitants, you know, that came down and traded horses and mules with ancient Tyre. Ezekiel 38, 6 states that Beth Togomar comes from the remote parts of the north with their troops. Ancient Togomar was also known as Tilgarumo, an, As an Assyrian nation. That nation, that territory today occupies what we call modern Turkey, which is north of Israel. So if you see all these nations that are identified here in this place, these identifications of Ezekiel 38 and 39, they predict that these nations will invade the land of Israel with this vast confederation of nations from north of the Black Sea and Caspian Sea, extending down to, through modern Iran in the east, Libya to the west, as far down as Sudan to the south. So if we look at this in today's picture, we're looking at Russia needing five major key allies, Turkey, Iran, Libya, Sudan, and the nations of Central Asia. By the way, all those nations other than Russia, all those nations are Muslim nations, Iran, Libya, Sudan. All three of those names that are mentioned there, I just mentioned with Iran, Libya, and Sudan, are Israel's most ardent opponents. They have one desire, that is the annihilation and the desolation of every living Jew. Iran has been identified as the axis of evil nations that's trying to desperately equip itself with nuclear weapons and getting plenty of help from Russia to do so. But many of these nations are hotbeds 
for militant Islam. And they're either forming or strengthening their ties even as we preach this message today with one goal. This list of nations from Ezekiel reads like a who's who from the modern news stories of today, of what's going on in the world today. It doesn't require any particular bit of sanctified imagination to somehow envision, you know, these nations conspiring together to invade Israel in the near future. They would love to do, they've made attempts to do in the past, but now this alignment is unique. Now the Bible says this is going to happen. So first question, once we identify who, would be who, then, then, then when? When is this going to take? What is the period? Verse 8 says, after many days, you'll be summoned. In the latter years, you will come into a land that is restored from the sword, whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations. Who is that? In the mountains of Israel, that's Israel. Remember, we said Israel will be dispersed as Jesus prophesied. The temple will be torn down. The Jews will be dispersed around the world. All that happened just as he prophesied. And justice was prophesied by the prophets before him even. The nation was dispersed. And as prophesied... 2,000 plus years later, the nation is now restored into the land, just as Ezekiel 38 says. When this nation comes back and is restored, those valley of dry bones, breath is breathed into them, they come in, they don't have walls necessarily surrounding them, they don't have the protection around them. So what happens during this time? It's either very near or prior to the tribulation or prior to Antichrist to kind of give him a strategic platform if there's this kind of battle before he steps on the scene. The world's obviously in chaos. He comes in as the savior, you know, and do the power vacuum in the Middle East. The Antichrist can come in, make this peace treaty to bring peace to the world, to, to a world that's only known child and trouble and war in this part of the world. Now, obviously, there's a lack of Muslim influence for the Antichrist to have to deal with in the beginning. Why? Because Gog and Magog, God deals a lot with those Muslim nations, all right? But it continues through the tribulation when Antichrist has to deal with himself. So as you go through this process, we see that this is one of the major wars, as we said a few weeks ago, that will occur just prior to the return, you know, or the rapture of the church, or obviously before the second coming of Christ. It's a Middle East war. It's led by Russians, Gog and Magog. Armageddon follows maybe seven, eight years later. Now, remember, Armageddon was that last great war where 20 million Orientals crossed the dry Euphrates River. That's not going to be a nuclear war. That's just the Lord and his glory where the sword goes out of his mouth and he speaks a word and the Antichrist and those armies are destroyed. Revelation 14 describes that, that ba battle is where there's so much confusion and chaos when the Lord speaks that these people all turn on each other and the blood rises to the horse's range, if you remember that. So when is this going to happen? I believe any time now between now and the rapture of the church, you know, I believe any time before the beginning of the tribulation. Now, I believe that the rapture of the church, we'll talk about more next week, will be concurrent somewhere in this time period. But remember, the rapture is not the beginning of the tribulation period. It's the signing of a seven-year peace treaty that begins the tribulation where Antichrist steps on the scene. So when is this period? I believe we're, we're living in these days where this could happen at any time. But remember, as we look at this, we talked about, well, what's the purpose of this war? Why, why is this going to happen? Look at Ezekiel 38, verse 9 and 12. You're going to go up, come like a storm. You'll be like a cloud covering the land, you and all your troops and many people with you. And thus says the Lord God, it will come about on that day that thoughts will come into your mind. You will devise an evil plan and you will say, I'm going to go up against the land of unwalled villages. I'm going to go to those who are at rest, that live securely, all them living without walls, having no bars or gates to capture, to spoil, to seize plunder, and to turn your hand against the waste places which are now inhabited, and against the people who are gathered from the nations, the Israelis, who have acquired cattle and goods, who live at the center of the world. So we're going to go up, and we're going to take a spoil, basically. What's, what, their, their intentions are, are obviously, there's, there's really the invading forces have about four main goals. One, they want more territory. Remember, there's, I, I mentioned before that when in the Western mindset, like with U.S. versus the Eastern mindset with Asia and China and Russia, it's a completely different way of thinking. And because we don't understand that, we do a lot of stupid things in America with our leadership. I mean, we've just done some, made some, you know, the Russians don't think in the, co in the context of helping other people find freedom, breaking the chains of bondage and slavery, human rights. America does. We're the ones who would talk about nation building. 
The Russians don't talk about nation building. They talk about building their own nation in greater territorial size by conquer. And that was pretty much the general mindset of all nations up to the American Revolution and the birth of America. Uh, Brother Jimmy Cabrera sent me a tremendous little minute and a half video clip the other day about a, of, a, of, a, of a world leader and a banker who was interviewing a friend of his from China who came over and was studying uh, philosophy at the Harvard Business one, I forgot what school it was, but he's there and he was asking about how it was going, coming out of a communist mindset, you know, and a socialist mindset. He said, you know, there's something unique about America that I never really realized about democracy. He says, you have to have Christianity for democracy to effectively work. Because Christianity, people assume a mindset that they're going to have to be accountable to God and they have to be accountable to laws. He said, that's not true in another, the rest of the world. We don't, we don't grow up with religion in these communist countries. We don't grow up with the mindset of God and his authority and being accountable and answering to God. He said, in fact, my view of this is, the summation of all this, he went on to say, was the less the church impacts the culture, the more socialist the culture becomes. The less the church is effective in reaching each young generation that comes along. They're more inviting that socialism and communism become. But that's why the church needs to be more aggressive, more alive, more radical, more passionate than ever before. That's why we sitting here today need to wake up and realize there's empty chairs all around us. We could fill up ourselves next Sunday if we really wanted to. We could really do that. There's no problem with that. If we really wanted to next Sunday, we'd be bringing in more chairs. But it takes more than a preacher and it takes more than a band. It takes the church influencing the culture, individuals loving Jesus enough to love the world. Otherwise, there's not much hope for future generations. These people have one mindset. We want to acquire more property. We want the land for ourselves. And if you follow the scriptures, there it says, and their idea is to amass wealth. You realize that some of the greatest wealth in the world is in Israel. Some of the richest people live in Israel. Some of the top billionaires and wealthiest people in the world live in the nation of Israel. It's become a very wealthy nation. They also basically want to destroy the people of Israel to destroy them completely, annihilate them. You've seen Iranian news. You've seen, you've seen the terrorist marches. You've seen the idea of beheading and destroying and killing and annihilating. That's always been the mindset of the Muslim world when it comes to the Jews. And the fourth, they want to directly confront the Antichrist. And this falls really into two categories, depending when this war happens. Either they're moving in to confront the Antichrist who's in Israel because the church is gone now, or it happens prior to the rapture and they're there to do what I think is probably, they're there to challenge and confront the West, which is the U.S. and the allies of Israel, which they're already seeking to do now by shooting little missiles at American ships and by having little Iranian war boats come and, and, and tread close to our carriers and always kind of poking and always kind of prodding or taking our, one of our naval ships and humiliating American naval men on national TV always poking, always trying to confront, always trying to challenge. Well, this is going to be their biggest challenge. According to Daniel 9, 27, they're going to be hating anybody that is allied with the Abrahamic people. And remember, there are curses and blessings for people who bless Israel or curse Israel. That's why we must always maintain an attitude of, 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 of diplomacy and relationship and support of the nation of Israel if we want to experience the blessings of God. So these invading forces have these goals in mind. That's, that's what they're about to do. That's what they're hungry to do. In Ezekiel 39, as you look at it, the divine purpose of, their, of the invasion is stated there. And it's expressed well because the divine purpose is pretty simple. God is doing something here, all right? God is going to show himself as the God of justice and the God of holiness and the God of righteousness. The Bible says he will be sanctified in the eyes of the nations. This is going to be a supernatural occurrence when, the, when they come in to invade and it looks like a sheer annihilation. It's not going to be a sheer annihilation. God's going to display his glory in that instance. And it says in that moment, the house of Israel will know that I am the Lord, their God from that day on. In other words, it's going to be such a supernatural occurrence. Nobody in Israel is going to doubt that God's on their side. Now, remember, 90% of Israel, you know, is not religious. Only a small group are religious. 
but they're going to get real religious real fast. I believe this is part of what Romans is talking about when Paul spoke and said, you know, Israel's going to be saved. In my zeal and in my blazing wrath, it says there, you know, God's going to do something against the enemies and Israel's going to see this invading force dealt with by the God of grace and God of glory. What's going to happen in this war? Ezekiel 38 tells us, if you read those verses, it will come about on that day when God, when this leader comes against the land of Israel and declares the Lord that my fury will mount up in my anger and my zeal and my blazing wrath, I will declare on that day that there will be surely a great earthquake in the land of Israel. Now, if you follow this chapter through, it talks about several things that happen during this time of annihilation. This is going to be a big, big focused invasion with these particular nations involved. And you see as they make their invasion effort into the land and onto the mountains of Israel, they meet a tremendous fate. And even there's this aftermath that follows this great annihilation. In other words, when Russia assembles this last day strike force, it's going to look like the end of Israel. But God is in control. As in history of every instance, he's been in control of this instance. There were similar efforts in 1967 and 1973 by other Arab nations. They didn't all qualify for this list. That's why we don't believe it was Gog and Magog. I believe in 67 it came very close. But God says when this time comes, there's going to be, I'm going to mount up in my fury. And I will destroy these godless invaders that come in. And he deals with the annihilation as you follow through chapter 38. He, 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 through, in, in verses 19 and 20, he tells, here's how we'll destroy them. And if you follow it through, he talks about a great earthquake. And he talks about confusion among the troops of the various nations. In other words, this chaos, this powerful earthquake takes place. The armies of each of these nations represented. It's kind of like the battle of uh, Armageddon. They begin to turn against each other. And then after this, it talks about diseases. In fact, this will be the largest case of death by friendly fire in history as they seek to even destroy each other. And then there's smoke with a disease. And then it talks about torrential rain, hailstones, fire, burning sulfur. It looks like kind of a nuclear, a limited nuclear holocaust takes place on the mountains of Israel. Now, this is not going to be a six-day war. It's going to be a one-day war. In fact, it might be a one-hour war when God supernaturally destroys this, this combination of Russian and Islamic horde that comes in. Now, the aftermath, you can follow that through as you can study a little bit later on. I encourage you to read it in Ezekiel 39, where he talks about that Ezekiel says, the, God will welcome the birds and the beast. You know, there's going to be so much carnage left from the slaughter. It provides a great feast for the birds and the beasts to come in. And God refers to that carnage as my sacrifice and my table to which he invites the guest of these buzzards and, and flesh-eating beasts to come in and, and destroy the bodies. Also following that, if you look at the story in Ezekiel 39, 11, 12, 14 through 16 in that area, it says they are burying the dead for seven months. In fact, cleanup squads are assembled together in Israel. And it's their responsibility to go out through the land. And where, as they go through the land, they're looking for bones and death. And they set up markers wherever they see death or human bones or, or remnants. And then after the markers are there, they go and select more places. Behind them comes the grave diggers. They come in. They see the markers. They take the remains. They gather them. And they take them to the Valley of Gog. Hordes is what it's called for burial. In fact, the cleansing will be so extensive that the Jews will set up a little town there. It'll be established just to aid those people who are cleansing the land. And the Bible talks about it in Ezekiel, that name of that town will be Hamanoah. Then there's the dispensing of the weaponry for seven years to, to, to melt down, destroy, to burn down all the weaponry. And then 3922 talks about, and the blessings of God will come. In the midst of God's fury, in the midst of God's wrath, he also pours out his grace and he pours out his mercy. And God uses this awesome display of his power against Russia and against your allies. And, there, and it says and to, to bring many to salvation, both Jews and Gentiles. And many of those who turn to the Lord at this time. And remember, I believe this is a time when the church has just gone or going. All right. Many of those who turn to the Lord at this time will see it, do this great demonstration of power they've seen on the mountains of Israel. They'll be a, a, among that vast group of the redeemed that are described in Revelation 7 who ultimately lose their life for the Lord. Now you say, but Joe, I just know, how, how is all this, I mean, how, how is this significant today? 
Well, let me reiterate just a couple of quick points. One, how's it, how do we th- why do we think it's today? Why, why do we believe we're in that time and, and, and you know, this kind of, this, this age where we could see this particular battle take place? One, because of the significance of the restoration of the land of Israel. This could not take place until Israel was restored. Now they're restored. They've regathered, mostly in unbelief. And it has, it has occurred in so the most dramatic ways in, in, in history. The Jewish population of Israel, as I said last week, is about eight and a half to, to million people. In fact, it's the first time in history there's been more Jews living in Israel than living in the United States. The present population of Jews in America is around seven million. And now it's eight and a half million. The second thing we had to see was the rise and the restoration of Russia as a world player and having world prominence. That has to be a necessary prerequisite for this invasion. Along with the United States, Russia, previously the Soviet Union, they've been the two greatest military powers. Under the administration of President Reagan, Russia was pretty much reduced to nothingness. I mean, they, they, were, they were on their way out. There were even some hopeful signs of democracy in the Russian front and in the Russian capital after the Soviet Union disbanded in 1991. But most people can look at the Russia today and see it's seeking to revive itself to the Russia and the USSR ways that it used to be. And although it has kind of a quasi-democratic role, it's really pretty much returning to its old totalitarianism, autocratic ways under Vladimir Putin, who kind of sees himself as the king there. Remember Putin comes out of the old KGB, he was one of the, the leaders. And he's made a lot of moves in the world today without much resistance from the United States to reestablish themselves as a central authority in that part of the world. Experts look at Russia today and they say the reason they've been able to come back with such vigor and such vitality, even so now that their nuclear weapons outrate our nuclear weapons and are more modern, modernized technologically, they say it's because Russia's oil wealth. And that's what's allowed Putin to take this country back towards the autocracy that they used to live under. And he's not getting any complaint from the average Russian. They love Vladimir Putin. For Russia, an invasion of Israel with an Islamic coalition would be an opportunity for her to reclaim all that lost glory and maintain its prominence in the world. In fact, December of 2005, Moscow News put this as their headlines. Vladimir Putin calls Russia the defender of the Islamic world. You can see him establishing ties with all these Soviet republics and previous Soviet republics. He said himself that Russia is the most reliable partner of the Islamic world and the most defendable, the most faithful defender of all its interests. They definitely have a vital interest in the Middle East and the Persian Gulf. Just this last week, an article from the Daily Caller News Foundation said this, the Obama administration policy failures in the Middle East have left a void where Russia plans to fill by establishing new naval bases in Syria and reactivating the air bases in Egypt. We already know they're establishing air bases in Syria. We already know their influence is there. In Syria, they said on that article, we will have a permanent naval base in Tartus. Defense Minister Nikolai Pankov, quoted by the Russian news agency, made that statement. He didn't provide a timeline as to when the upgrade would be completed. Went on to talk about the former Soviet Union operated an air base in Sidi Barani until it collapsed in the early 1900s, but now they're reestablishing that base will drastically improve our Russian air operations in the Middle East and Northern Africa. If all goes plans, our air bases will be operational by 2019, according to this source. So we see the friendliness and the, uh, and the cohesiveness between Russia and these Islamic nations. Now, There's a third element that we have to look at. You look at these nations that are mentioned other than Rosh, and you see the basis for their country, the motivation behind what they exist, and it's Islam, and it's terror. Russia's been very active in shoring up these terrorist nations' defenses, like Iran. They take actions both militarily and diplomatically to protect Iran. They're not hesitant about their support of Iran. We know in our nation that Iran is the number one promoter of terrorism in the world today. That Iran is home to some of those radical jihadist Muslims in the world. And some of those radical terror groups are funded by Iran. 
That's why there are many people in our country that oppose any help for Iran in their nuclear programs. Yeah, we've just made some of the dumbest deals we've ever made with Iran. One more, one more element has to play into this. And it's Turkey, which kind of seems to be on the out of this ally at this point. They have to be a willing ally to align themselves with Russia and with these Islamic nations. Right now, Turkey has spent the last probably decade or so just trying to align itself with the European Union. They wanted in that Western economic flow of money. They wanted to be a part of the EU. But the EU has pretty much denied every effort they've made to be a part of that. I mean, they made a lot of attempts for this reasons, you know. Uh, it looks like, well, Turkey's not going to necessarily be, uh, uh, you know, uh, allied against Israel. Turkey and Israel kind of have a good relationship at present. But you know the Middle East. Anything changes overnight. I mean, Ar Iran came into place overnight. Khomeini came into place overnight. He was an exiled leader. Anything takes place at any moment. How does it take place? According to the sovereignty of God. The Lord says, Daniel and Isaiah and other places, the continual reference that he's the God of all nations. At what time he'll exalt a nation, he'll exalt it. At what time he wants to put down a nation, he will put down a nation. But we'll see, as we're seeing already, EU keeps rejecting Turkey's bid for admission. And sooner or later, they'll give up on that. And I believe then they will lock horns with this Islamic group. Now, it does mention some countries that will not be involved. Let me just hit this list quick and, and, and see what it says here in Scripture. It says, Sheba and Dedan and the merchants of Tarshish with all its villages. King James says, with, with, with all its, the, the, the lines and its young whelps instead of villages, will say to you, have you come to capture spoil? Have you assembled your company to seize plunder, to carry away silver and gold and take away cattle and goods and to capture and plunder and to get a great spoil? In other words, these countries that are mentioned here are going to rise up and protest. We see it a lot in the UN. Somebody does something, countries rise up, they make a protest statement. Some of these countries are allied with Israel today. Do they come to their support? No. They just protest. Shame on you, Russia. Shame on you, Iran. We'll try to, you know, embarrass them at the United Nations, the UN. Remember my first trip to Israel, somebody in Israel, a Jewish guy, told me what UN really stood for. United nothing. Amen. So who are these countries? Well, Saudi Arabia clearly is identified with Sheba and Dedan, that Arabian Peninsula, which makes up countries, Yemen, Oman, Kuwait, the Arab Emirates. These are guys that are enjoying the wealth of the, of the West and enjoying trading with the West and making all this money. So economics will certainly come before demographics and, 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 and allegiance to religion in those worlds. They'll, they'll, re, they'll just say, no, you shouldn't be doing that. And then the others, it talks about Tarshish. Now, Tarshish is mentioned 20 times in the scriptures, and it was the country that was farthest away from Israel of the known times in the West. In fact, it was also known in Phoenician times as the place where, you know, they got all their tin. In fact, it was called the land of tin and later on called Britannia. Now that would be today, you know, in Great Britain, all right? And what is the symbol for Great Britain? It's the lion. And the lion here and its young whelps, it says in Ezekiel, the King James Version, they're the ones, it says villages in New America, they protest. Well, who would be those villages and the offspring of the lion, the, the young lions or the whelps, it calls it? Who is the offspring? Well, that would be the United States and Canada and Australia and New Zealand, uh, some African colonies that are still down there and, and, under English control or have relationships with, with England still. These, these are the nations that will not participate. These are the nations that say, you shouldn't do that. that that's not right. You, you shouldn't do that. Because what's going to happen? God's going to strip Israel intentionally of these allies so he demonstrates that he's in charge and that he's God over all the nations. In fact, if you study history, I know some of you are history buffs, if you look back in history in, into, the, into the Great Britain's history, you'll know that there was a time when the Spanish Armada tried to invade uh, King Philip and his forces and, and take over England so that Spain would be in charge. Now, if that would have happened, the United States would not be so much predominantly English and Protestant, it would be Spanish and Catholic. But if you look at the history of that invasion, there was this supernatural thing that took place. There were 70, 80 to 80 ships that came in. It took a miracle to stop them from overcoming England and God intervened in history again. But somewhere the United States meets some sad fate or becomes a lesser nation or just bails out on Israel completely so that it doesn't do anything. So there's not a really mention of them in the United States in regard to when we get in deeper into the tribulation.
I will say, by the way, if you're a Russian or a Cossack, it's not a good time for you. It's going to be a bad time. Why? Because God says, I am against you. Now, why is God against Gog and the Russian nation and these people? Because these are the people who for centuries have been persecuting God's people. And they will stand in judgment and God will stand in judgment over them. And he will stand in judgment, not only them, but every other nation that has done so. Now, remember, this prophecy is six, eight hundred years before the birth of Jesus Christ. All right. All right. This is a long time before where we are at. But you have to realize that God doesn't know time and space. That's why God can look in and tell us in the Bible what's going to happen in the future. So that's why God could look in at the book of Genesis and tell about a Savior that would come, you know, and save the people from the sin and say it all the way up to the birth of Jesus Christ. It was, God foresaw all those things. Now we're looking at time. God's already seen this time. He's already set this time in motion. It's kind of like... Uh, when you were a little kid, you ever see the music box, you know, and when you take it out, if you ever took it apart, I was always great at taking toys apart. Never put much good putting them back together, but I could take them apart really good. And I was always fascinated by that little, the little cylinder inside a music box, at least the old fashioned, had little pegs all over it, remember? And as the pegs would come around, it would strike a little note on the little note pads that were out there, little, little pieces of metal. It would strike those and it would play. So the only thing that was going to play was what was pre-pegged out on the cylinder. God has pre-pegged this cylinder, folks. All right? There are things that are, have happened and things that are going to happen just as God said they would happen. And this is one of the things that, that you have to be absolutely blind and willfully ignorant not to read the Bible and see what has happened was according to what God said would happen and what is going to happen and what is even happening now are things that God told us in scripture would happen if there's anything that's an argument for the, the power and the truth of scripture it's prophecy I mean it just is over and over we see one miracle after another where God does these things and things happen but here's this judgment that comes about you say why God why is God not like Russia man for centuries God looked ahead in time and saw that when the birth of the church would take place and even prophesied that you would be hated by many nations and you would be sought after and you would be persecuted and you would be killed for my name's sake. When that prophecy was made, God, as he gives that prophecy to men of old through the power and the inspiration of the Spirit, had already seen ahead into the nations that would come and how the Russians would hate believers. In fact, there was, there was a past president of the American Communist Party by the name of Gus Hawley. He made this statement. I will not be satisfied until I see the blood and the guts of every Christian in America running into the sewers and the gutters of America. Other communist leaders made this statement. I will cut the throats of all the Christians and their children, lay them over their Christian altars, and let them drown in their own blood. It was Stalin who said, I long to see the day when I see the last preacher strangled to death with the guts of the last lawyer. You wonder why God's opposed to him? We talk about the Jewish Holocaust and the Nazis killing 6 million Jews. Do you realize that under Stalin and these guys, they killed probably 8 to 10 million Christians. For years, two-thirds of the world lay under the oppression of communism where they sought to burn every Bible and blot out every believer. Their official position from the day they were birthed has been, there is no God. Karl Marx rejected the idea of God. He said God is just an opiate of the masses. When the Iron Curtain fell, there were a lot of people who really believed that communism was dead. But if you'll travel with me to some of those eastern post-communist countries today, they'll tell you it's not dead. And those communist parties are very active in each one of those post-Russian countries, post-USSR countries, seeking to take back control. It's interesting what God says. I'm going to put hooks in their jaws. I'm going to put an evil thought in their mind. And they're going to come to take a plunder. But God is just drawing them in. God is doing this work. Give me, give me five more minutes, all right? Can you say yes, sir, Brother Joe? Yes, sir. I want to show you how this almost happened. I, I shared this with you years ago, but I don't know if it's been in recent years. This almost happened in 1967. 
If you ever get a book, a chance to read any books by a guy named Lance Leverage, you might find them on eBay now. I don't think they're published anymore. But he deals a lot with history. A lot of this was shared about the 1967 war in Israel on that recent TV piece I mentioned a week or so ago. It talks about the miracle of Israel. You might be able to find it on the internet where they interview all these old guys and all these old ladies who were in those wars. And they talk to them about how, how that war was won. I mean, miracle after miracle, they tell how, how, how they should have been annihilated, but once. I don't know how clear the map is, but when it comes up, put it on all three screens there if you can just for a minute. You'll see, it'll start playing out. You see the nation of Israel and, and you see everything laid out there. Is If you look, this was October 6, 1973. It is Holy Day. It's, it's a day when people fast and pray. 90% of Israeli forces are on leave. Only 10% are in place. At 2 p.m. in the afternoon, Syria and Egypt invaded on the northern end and then the southern end of Israel. It was planned to be the annihilation of Israel. They came in with 4,000 tanks, 900 missile batteries, numerous and new improved weapons that Russia had given them, even not even yet tested that Russia was sending them in the field. In the Golan up here where Syria is on that border, there were 1,200 tanks that lined up to attack Israel. 1,200 tanks on a 20-mile front. Do you realize that's more tanks than France and Britain have combined? 1,200. Hey, when Hitler invaded Russia, he invaded with 1,000 tanks on a 200-mile front. There was an Israeli major with 132 troops was all that was on, on call because of Yom Kippur. One Israeli major, 132 troops. He was up on the Western Golan Heights. They held off 1,200 invading tanks. Supernaturally, one man alone Historians wrote, destroyed over 100 tanks by himself. One Israeli soldier in a tank that had been so shot up, all it would move was the turret. He took out 10 Syrian tanks after he'd been taken out. The entire sector of the Golan Heights, all right, was just pretty much left unmanned. The Egyptians from the south, they attacked. Abba Eben, the Israeli foreign minister, said to the UN on October 8th, he says, Egypt has attacked us with 3,000 tanks, 2,000 heavy guns, 1,000 aircraft, and 600,000 men. Syrians came within one mile of the Golan headquarters. Within one mile, they stopped. There were only two tanks and 10 Israeli soldiers in front of them. And they stopped. They thought it was a trap. They're not going any farther. They didn't, trust, they didn't trust the Egyptians. They didn't trust their allies. They didn't realize that in front of their 3,000 tanks, there were 90 tanks <laughs> that separated them from the goal of taking Tel Aviv. I think I shared the story about this one not so spiritual Israeli captain. He sat at the height of the fight in the Golan. He looked up and he saw up there in the sky a great gray hand pressing down if it were holding something back. The Syrian commander up there supposedly under that gray hand, he made comments in his writing. He said, you know, we just stopped up there. And somebody said, why didn't you keep going? He said, well, we didn't see the need to. There was such little resistance. He said, the view, the view was so fantastic and the Galilee was so beautiful. We just had to take it in. Now, if you've been up on the Golan Heights with us one of our trips, you know how beautiful that is. It's breathtaking. Yeah. The stops by the Egyptians, thinking it was trapped, stopped by the Syrians, gives Israel their time to mobilize their army. They came back and they pushed the Syrians back to within 10 miles of Damascus. Pushed them all the way back and asked to go ahead and capture. In fact, their tanks encircled in a 10 mile, out, 10 mile radius of Damascus, they encircled the city 10 miles out. They are equipped with missiles that will reach 17 mile firing range. General Eric Sharon trapped the entire third Egyptian army in the south. And he begged them to go, let us go all the way and let's destroy Egypt. It was that juncture that United States President Nixon made a call to Mr. Brezhnev in Russia. He said, if you step in there, because all the signs pointed they were getting ready to invade as well. He said, we can step in there. Because two hours after the fighting began, Russian cargo planes loaded with ammunition, loaded with weapons, loaded with men. They left the Russian airspace headed for Egypt and Syria. There's proof that they were already in the air before the fighting even started. Russian soldiers were captured inside Russian tanks in the Sinai. Five Russian MiGs were shot down there with Russian pilots. Russian paratroopers were captured in the area. In Alexander, Russian cruiser was in the port with nuclear warheads on board. Russia's ready to step in, invade, and be a part of this. 
But Egypt and Syria, as we said, they stopped. The planned annihilation, it didn't happen. Say why? Wasn't God's time yet. Wasn't God's time to do his thing, but he certainly invaded when you start reading history. When you go to Israel, one of the places we, we always go to is we go up on Masada. And we talk about Masada and we talk about the history of Masada. I don't know if you've ever seen the, a movie that came out years ago or studied the history of Masada. When the Jewish were revolt, revolt, revolting against the Roman invasion, the, the, kind of the last stance they took was at Masada. And it was in a place up on a high, what we would call a plateau kind of mountain. All right, And it's very well protected. And you can fight off enemies for a long time trying to come up the side of that thing. And if you ever saw the movie Masada... Uh, it, it's a great movie that tells the whole story of what took place and it came I think back in the 70s or 80s was when that movie came out but you can probably Netflix it or something but it was a, I think it was a mini series that came out but anyway Jews for years since Masada happened they've had what was called the Masada complex when General Savannah's where the, Rus where the Romans were invading they came to Masada and they lost a lot of men trying to invade it so they decided they'd build a ramp up the side so they could invade it that way. It took them days, it cost them lots of lives to finally get that ramp up. When there's no hope left, those Jewish survivors on top of Masada decided they would just take their own lives. And when the, Russians, when the Romans finally got in there and they got through the, that, the defense forces that were there, everybody ultimately killed themselves. Now the theory had been since history, after 400 years of enslavement, or enslavement by the Egyptians, after the gas chambers of Dachal and Buchenwald, the death was superior to slavery. In fact, the graduating cadets from the Israeli forces, their last event before they crowned as graduates from their training is they're in full armament and full backpacking gear. They have to run up the sides of Masada. And as they're running up for the graduation ceremony at the top, and it's not an easy run. I've walked it and it's no fun. They're chanting all the way up, Masada shall not fall again. Masada shall not fall again. They say Israel's mindset has changed now from a Masada complex to a Samson complex. Remember, Samson took his own life, just like they did Masada. But hey, he took everybody with him. Amen. Israel feels like the world let him down. They nearly lost that war in 67. On the 10th day, American supplies got there. No Germans, British, or French would let them let us supply and refuel. But finally in Cyprus on the 10th day of that event, we will fuel. But Israel's mindset is if we go, everyone goes. Next time we go all the way, there's no stopping an all-out war. We will destroy or capture every army that raises its arm against us, particularly the Saudis, who ultimately pour billions of dollars into Arab armies. Now, we're, the stage is set. Can you see that? Geographically, politically, everything is set. Uh, one more little element of this turkey issue will fall into place. And when that happens, hey, you've, you've already read the story. You know how it's going to turn out. You know, I, I hate to be a spoiler alert, but <laughs> I have a spoiler alert for the whole thing. We win. Amen. The church wins. Israel wins. God wins. We all win. <laughs> We're not pessimists. We're not pessimists. We're the, we're the ultimate optimist. Jesus is coming. Amen. I mean, we ought to live with one eye up towards heaven at all times. Uh, the, the first century Christians, they, they understood it more than we do, and they were still a couple thousand years out from the ultimate end of it all. But they used to greet one another with Maranatha, which means the Lord comes. <laughs> the Lord comes. Hallelujah. That's better than hello. Amen. Or how's it going, bud? <laughs> Maranatha. The world's going to realize more and more and more so that hope can only really be found in our Heavenly Father Amen. and the offer of life and salvation that comes through the Lord Jesus Christ. All you have to do is take some time to read the book, look at history, you'll see where we are. That leads you ultimately to a choice, a choice that you're going to live with and your choice you're going to die with. The only thing that offers us salvation, the only thing that offers us hope, the only thing that offers us reality is the sacrifice of Jesus Christ on behalf of our sins that we can be made right and we can have fellowship with God because of the cross of Jesus Christ amen. what grace you say you believe that all happened amen you believe all that's going to happen amen. amen how can I not believe the rest of the book if I just believe the first part of the book amen. the first part of the book is all the history laid out for us about a coming Messiah then we have Messiah a savior a deliverer I commit my life to him am I going to say I don't believe the rest of the book 
That invalidates the first of it. Amen. We're at a time, folks, it's probably one of the most interesting times ever. That's why I believe when we started this church 20 plus, 28 years ago, the byline, our logo that we've embraced dearly and hold clear to our heart is for such a time as this. Amen. We're here for a reason. You're here for a reason. You're here not just to attend church. You're here to impact your world, to make a difference, to make a difference in your family, to make a difference in your friends. We're not here as pessimists. Oh, you guys, gonna, the world's going to burn up. Well, the Bible says it is, but that's not bad news. You're getting a better one. <laughs> There's a new world, a new heaven, a new earth, and a new day. That's what we look forward to. God's good. God's a good God. And in his goodness and in his righteousness, he is justly dealing with transgression and with sin. Judge the nations. He's judging them righteously. He's not a bad judge. He's a righteous judge. He's the perfect judge. When you and I stand before him, it'll be based on righteous and fair judgment. What happens when I stand before him? Jesus was judged on my behalf. Amen. Hopefully yours as well. That's when we hear, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of the Lord. These days are before us. We need to wake up and smell the roses, so to say. Would you stand with your head bowed? Father, we come to you today and thank you for your blessing.